So just a few things is that the toilets are there, right? And as you can see, we've got the doors open, and um, that's for egress for health and safety. We have the bar open at the back if you want to go and have a drink, um, because we've done all that sort of jazz. Um, I'd like to, to bring your attention to Penny. She's come down and she's doing this sort of thing for you people and us, and me especially, because I can go back to 1989 and I had one of these problems that you people are going through at the present moment and it wasn't very nice. I lost my job, I lost a lot of things, um, and the prices went up. And I've got to tell you this, this is something, this is true. We in Wainui at the time, we were a pretty well-knit community, like Carterton, exactly like Carterton, we had a, a $234,000 debt. That's all we had when Lower City Council took us over about three months later. We had a $11 million debt. Now, if you can go back and you'll find that that is true. I was told that um, by one of the engineers. He's still alive today. Um, so I'd like you to think about those things when you talk about this. But um, I said that we were going to charge for it tonight. But seeing that you people and, and Penny have done such a good job, it's going to be free. So thank you very much for that. I would like to see a bigger turnout, of course, but I dare say that everybody talks about these things and goes around Carterton because we all love Carterton and all the other places too. So, and I do know what you're talking about. So thank you very much anyway for coming along and do come back, we've got a nice club here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. It's a bit geographically challenging to be a member of the Carton RSA from Auckland, otherwise we not what. Okay, folks, it's been a while since I've been in the RSA. How many of you remember my mum, Lucy Bright? She used to be a member of the RSA, and after she passed about 20 years ago, we had a commemoration for her next door. Um, I came to Carterton when I was 10, from Upper Hutt with the family, went to South End School, went to Kurunui College. Um, if anyone had told me when I was a seventh former prefect in the prefect's room that one day I was going to end up with advanced trade in sheet metal engineering, New Zealand's first ticketed woman welding inspector, in charge of making sure that pressure vessels didn't blow up in people's faces. Um, I would have gone, what? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, my life has been a, a series of historical accidents when it comes to employment. And yeah, it's just how things work out. Um, I ended up spending about 16 years in a totally male dominated world of. Um, yeah, boil making and stainless, and then teaching thousands of boys and men how to weld for nine years at Monaco Tech as a welding tutor. So I have a, I had a quality assurance background when I worked in the stainless steel fabrication plant, and being one of the rare breed that used to actually read the spec and read the codes. Um, yeah, it's a bit like legislation, it's just words separated by letters and numbers and don't be frightened, just read it. Don't be frightened, just read it. Because I'll tell you what, when it comes to the law, my experiences in local government, they just make it up. <laughs> and um, the reason why I know this is that um, I do also have an activist background and I know that activists tend to get a bit of bad press. But hey, we're active and we get things done. And yeah, so in my life, I mean, I got involved in the anti apartheid movement, started a branch of the Halt Racist Tours movement at Kurumi College in my seventh form year, and it sort of took off from there. Um, when it comes to local government, uh, I have been arrested 22 times in defence of the principles of open, transparent,
transparent and democratically accountable run for government. And although I never went to university and I've never had a day's legal training in my life, it ended up 21 1 to me. And yeah, so I think that that's, that's quite a worry when ordinary people have to do extraordinary things to make a stand for the law that is supposed to equally apply at local government level. Because I can tell you, particularly in Auckland, that is not the case. Now, some people will know I've had a bit of publicity recently because um, Auckland Council, in a draconian abuse of municipal power and authority, tried to, have tried to force the racing sale of my freehold home. And I've never done that before. And yeah, the reason for that is that since 2007, I have disputed and refused to pay my rates because Auckland City Council and after them, Auckland Council have not followed their lawful statutory obligations and told the people where exactly our rates money is being spent. And my particular interest is, interest is in money spent on consultants and contractors. I want to know the name of the consultants or contractor. I want to know the scope of the contract, the term and the value of the contract, and whether or not it's been put out for tender. This is public money. We have a right to know where every dollar is being spent, invested and borrowed. And in Auckland, there are billions of dollars going where we don't, and we don't know where. Um, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Strangely enough, you will not the date. 2010, uh, I got a good citizen's award. This was at a time that I was disputing and refusing to pay the minutes of council rates, and I get an award for being a good citizen. Now, how did that happen? It's because it was recognised at local board level the work that I was doing and fighting for transparency particularly in contracting and also my work in fighting against water privatisation. I'm media spokesperson for the Water Pressure Group and we have been at the forefront of trying to stop the privatisation of water, particularly in Auckland. And what we were fighting was to try and stop the one big Auckland water company because we believe it's been set up for privatisation by a public-private partnership with United Water who've been sitting there like a giant octopus wanting to unfurl their work, their chemicals and get more lot. Um, so far, we've managed to stop that happening, but we, were, we never got a vote on the one big water company. It was forced upon us by central government. We never got a vote on whether or not we wanted this amalgamation in Auckland. And what happened? We got seven democratically elected councils, yes, what's and all, but democratically elected councils replaced with seven undemocratic, unelected, selected council controlled organisations. Each of these unelected council controlled organisations has its own unelected board of directors, business people. It has its own CEO. It has executive staff, non-executive staff, officers, normal admin staff, etc., vehicles, blah, blah, blah. So who's telling you this? That economies of scale, you swap seven democratically elected councils with seven undemocratically selected corporate controlled organisations. And I have done study and research on council controlled organisations that nobody else has done. And what I discovered was that prior, and I made my submission to the Royal Commission on Regional Governance saying nobody has ever done a cost benefit analysis, analysis on any council controlled organisational model. And I have paperwork that shows that the Office of the Auditor General has never done a cost benefit analysis. Neither has the Department of Internal Affairs. Neither had any of the eight councils, previous councils that made up the Auckland region, and to cap it all off, Treasury. Lovely Treasury here to head. They had never done cost benefit analysis either. The Office of the Auditor General in 2012, when they did this report on Auckland, they said 35 
percent of rate payer money is going to council control organisations. No taxation without representation. We never got to vote for the model. We never got to vote for the people. Over a third of our rates are going to these corporate control organisations and where they spend the money. You see, the problem is that under the Local Government Rating Act, you are entitled as ratepayers to know where exactly your money is going and it's spelled out on the rates assessment form. But council control organisations are not local authorities. So there is no mandatory requirement for their spending to be put on your rates assessment notice. So how do you know where money is going? Well, with Auckland Transport, I just stumbled across the fact that, yeah, they actually did have the devilish detail for which I've been fighting for the last seven years. The name of the, 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 the contractor, the unique contract number, um, scope of the contract, value, etc. All contracts worth more than $50,000. I thought, that's exactly what I've been fighting for. Why is that information equally available to Auckland Council? and the rest of the council control organisations. Why is that information not there for public scrutiny? It's our money. So, yeah. This is what you're not being told. Okay, I, I acknowledge that I have a pay rate since 2007, I'm not explaining why, but this is an Auckland City Council rates and voice which shows for the 2010 year can you read the total the total amount in that year was one thousand three hundred and ninety five dollars and forty three cents 2010 before the super city now you need to know that Auckland Council water and wastewater are charged separately. So when you think, oh God, I'm living in Auckland, they seem to have cheap rates bills, and it's because the water is charged separately. And with user pays for water and wastewater, what has ha what's happened is that rates have been reduced um, for very high value properties, and you've got poor, bigger families that need to use more water and wastewater who pay as much, if not more, for their water as their rates. Okay, so just bear that in mind, please, that you can sort of look at a net, pretty much an extra amount in a lot of cases for what the water and wastewater bills are. So what do you pay for your water and wastewater? What do I pay? Yeah. Right now, can I come back to you on that one? Ask me that. Okay, so here we have the um, Auckland Council, the rates in 2015, $2,327.06. We were supposed to have the economies of scale. This was supposed to be good for citizens and late payers. So, oh sorry, the other thing is that you need to know, of course, we got one of the Auckland Regional Council and what happened was that what we used to pay the Regional Council got incorporated, to be fair, got incorporated into the Auckland Council rate, which is one of the rates, as you know, to our regional body. But the rates back in 2010 for the ARC were $283.89. So that's not a lot of money, okay? So you know, over $900 more. So my rates increase has ended up being Who's telling you that? Who's telling you that? How many people have, have you, you know, in Auckland, friends, relations, whatever? You talk to one ordinary person who likes the super city, <coughs> or maybe they don't want to use their telephone box somewhere, because um, people up in Auckland, the vast majority of citizens and ratepayers, hate the super city. That's why citizens and ratepayers are a cross between a giant cash cow and an ATM machine. All pay, no say. Very good say. Oh, I'm going to look back to it. Um, yeah, so, the other thing that you need to know about, about CCOs is that council control organisations have been the mechanism for the corporate takeover of the world. That's how they've done it. Okay? We have got to say, and what really gets to me about this draft Wellington reorganisational proposal is that there is so little upfront talk 
an explanation to the public about the CCOs. Because this is how it works. You have governments and you have infrastructure. But really, it's all about infrastructure. Economies of scale are all about bigger contracts, fewer but bigger private contractors. It's all about bigger economies of scale for property developers, speculators, investors, and financial institutions. I only found out over Christmas, and, and I don't know a bit about local government, this was news to me, I didn't know that, that, that Auckland Council had got a law change back in 2011, which gave Auckland Council the power and authority to lawfully borrow overseas in foreign currency. And it's like, hello, I don't remember as a citizen of Rapid of Auckland being asked, dear citizen of Rapid, do you think Auckland Council should have the lawful right to borrow overseas when you citizens of ratepayers are the backstop to pay that debt? And just to let you know, how much debt has Auckland Council got now? I'm an investigative activist and what I do is heaps and heaps of official information at requests. Okay, I mean, I know that there's been some rather nasty and abusive things said about me behind my back, um, but the, the, the facts are that I get my facts straight. Okay, 14th of August last year, the debt total of the Auckland Council, $5.5 billion. And where's that money going? Where do they? Does that include the Harbour Board debt? Because the council well, owns the Harbour. Pass. Well, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm just talking about It's actually a pretty important uh, point. Fair enough. But the other thing that I find really horrifying is guess how much Auckland Council is exposed to derivatives? What are derivatives? Sort of gambling, hedging your bets on your debts. Guess how much? As of the 14th of August last year, Auckland Council is exposed to derivatives. $5.8 billion. $5.8 billion, and where are we going to say that we wanted our council to have that lawful authority to effectively gamble with our hard-earned money? You know, what's happened to the, you see what's happened with the Swiss franc and the national Swiss bank supposed to be safe as houses? Seems it's not quite so safe as houses. So how do we know what our Auckland Council Treasury, where they have been having the flutter with our money? <coughs> where do we do that information? We are not talking little tens of thousands of dollars here that can make such a huge difference to community projects. We are talking eye-watering amount numbers of zeros here. Billions of dollars. Let me tell you something else about this super city. And oh, we've got all these plans. Well, hey, hang on. Each of the corporate controlled organisations, they have to have their own statement of intent. I mean, is that mentioned anywhere? Why not? It's not. And I've done research, which no one else has done, because there was this mantra, Auckland, Auckland's going to get a million more people in another 30 years. Repeating it, repeating it, like the Roger Lomitz mantra, public is bad, private is good. You know, the Ministry of Works guy leaning on a shovel and having a smoke, so that means that they didn't do anything else. They didn't build any roads, dams, bridges, whatever. They <coughs> leaned on the shovel and had a smoke. And where's the cost benefit analysis that the Ministry of Works model was broken? That's right, that was intended. Okay, so, there was a point there. <laughs> With, um, oh yes, growth. So I asked, where did this million extra people mantra come from? Dig, dig, dig. And I discovered that, although under the Local Government Auckland Council Act 2009, spatial planning must, must be evidentially based what happened was that one person, the Chief Planning Officer of Auckland Council, Dr. Roger Blakely, he put his hand up, and although there was a letter from the Department of Statistics recommending medium population growth projection, 700,000 extra people, <coughs> no, no, he thought it would be a good idea to go for the high population growth projection, so an extra 300,000 people are purportedly coming to Auckland on the say-so of one man. I got a select committee of inquiry, social services select committee of inquiry into this matter, 
and what I, I petitioned because what happened was two major infrastructure providers, Auckland Transport and Watercare Services, they were working to medium population growth projection. And I'm thinking, what is this? Like a magic mushroom, you close your eyes and then suddenly up sprouts the infrastructure, the roads, the school, you know, they just pop up without any planning. How come they're not on the same page? And what happened was, I did get an inquiry and uh, questions were asked of Marilyn Brown and Chief Planning Officer Dr Roger Blakely and the Select Committee reported back saying, we think it's reasonable. And I'm on a phone, telephone con yeah, conference with them, I said, I don't care if you think it's reasonable. My petition was asking, was it lawful? What is the point of your MPs making the law if you don't take the slightest bit of notice of it yourselves? Yeah, a little bit different here. So, I mean, but that's it. Seriously. File under, you couldn't make this stuff up. So what really concerns me is if you are borrowing, or if unknown people in the Treasury Department are borrowing against a future rating base of an extra 300,000 people that one person apparently just made up, how on earth is that not fortunate? Who's going to carry the can and be liable for that debt? Hello, citizens and ratepayers. So folks, um, I'm giving you some facts and evidence you won't get any of this. And what really concerns me about this Wellington draft, sorry, draft proposal is that there have been no independent audits, no thorough independent audits based on facts and evidence that prove the cost effectiveness of the Auckland super city model. Nobody's done that exercise. You know, simple piece of like, hang on, before you plunge into another disaster, what do you think that you might want to sharpen your pencils and you know, find junior planes and just think, well, is this a good idea? And what that draft reorganisation proposal is really right on, what's well, actually non existent, is facts and evidence of where do the costs fall now? And what happened was back in 2008, because I've got a quasi assurance background, just because I, I operate under the public service model and don't charge for my services doesn't mean the information I'm offering is worthless. This is what I said to the Royal Commissioners for Auckland Regional Governance. I said, here is a template you can use to establish now a snapshot of exactly where is the money going across the Auckland region. And I listed 112 possible council services. And then across the top, I listed, because I've, I've adapted this to Wellington, but the eight Auckland councils, the regional council, four city councils, and three district councils. And the first thing was to find out, are these services provided in-house, through council control organisations, or contracted out? So you have the big picture, who's providing the services. The next thing that you do is you take each service and what you do is you dig in. And this was as, as far as contracting was concerned. So yeah, okay, so animal control. And the question here, that I mean, I, 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 this was the first go, but um, I've subsequently fine-tuned it. <laughs> but the thing is that what you need to do for each of the services, you need to know who's currently providing that service. Who's currently providing that service? The service. What is the cost of the service? If it's contracted, who's got the contract across each of the, the council areas? How many people are employed? How many vehicles do they have an office? This is a data upon which you can rely for future sharing of council services and a proper basis for cost effectiveness. Because if you don't know where the costs are falling, is there any basis for cost effectiveness? And what I'm really unhappy about is that, in my considered opinion, the Auckland Royal Commissioners did not do their job because their clear terms of reference were based on cost effectiveness. 
They had huge powers. They would have got consultants. I mean, probably for what I've done for them would cost two or three hundred thousand dollars, whatever. But they could have dug in and got that information. But they never did it. They never did it. And um, and this is what I'm seeing for Wellington. Same thing. There is no data. What I'm thrilled to tell you that we're really very hard. And what I have done is I cut and pasted all the council services from each of the councils in the Greater Wellington region. And what I have done is now I have the whole basic list of all possible council services and regulatory functions across the entire Greater Wellington region. And what I will undertake to do is I will make that big master list and I will make that available because the question that needs to be asked of the local government commissioners is why have you not done this? How can the public make an informed submission when you don't have the facts and information to know when the costs are falling down? And I tell you why, because it's the same big business interests that are pushing this Wellington super city proposal. What happened was they said they, they, they said in, in Auckland's got to be internationally competitive. And who helped to push this? An organization which is known as the now known as the Committee for Auckland, New Zealand Council for Infrastructure and Development, the groups that represent the, the big main boys, boys and girls, and now that's like now Wellington's got to be competitive with Auckland. Folks, it's a race to the bottom. You've got the same big business, big businesses that push for the Auckland Super City, who are now pushing for the Wellington Super City. It's not for you people, it's all about, like I said, bigger economies of scale, big business contracts, property developers, and speculators, investors, and potentially financial institutions. Is that what you want? You want another massive transfer of public money to the private sector? Because that is what the super city is actually really about. Rates have skyrocketed. I'll give you my, my example. Debt has skyrocketed. Well, council services have dropped. Like, how does this work? You know, the, the booms, the grass? Well, who owns the booms? Is Auckland Council? Who administers the maintenance of the booms? Auckland Transport? They said, Auckland citizen right pays money to own booms. What? <laughs> As if, as if we're not being bled dry already. Already, they might be able to buy your own boobs. Anyway, so um, what else has plummeted is transparency, accountability, and democracy. This might sound totally irrelevant, but it's something that's happening in the room right now. Who was the group that was giving out brochures at the door? No idea. Because those brochures are totally irrelevant. Um, at the moment, we, we're looking at the doctrine of the super city, the status quo. Yes. Those brochures say, is a unitary authority for warrant a reasonably practical option? That is not an option. With all due respect, yep. this is effectively yep. a public meeting to explain what's happened in Auckland. I believe in freedom of expression. If people want to put out their pamphlets, don't agree with them, do agree with them, or don't agree with them, that's up to you. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the more debates and discussion, the better. And um, yeah, so that's your view, and then we'll talk to you. It's not a lot of It's a very good answer. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And um, I'm operating on about half 
full at the moment, so I'm extremely frugal with my water bills and they're monthly bills now. And um, in February, oh sorry, in January this year, it was uh, $16.50 for water, $22.01 and one cent for wastewater. Yeah, and it's not a
of the service activities and the regulatory functions. So number one, you need to have something that puts everybody on the same page so then you can compare apples with apples. Well, who's done that exercise? It appears that nobody has. And it seems like there's been some really highly paid consultants, uh, about half a dozen of them. Um, yeah, well, I don't know what they got paid to do, but nobody's come up with what I'm offering for free because I believe that the public have a right to know exactly where your money's going, and that's a mechanism for doing that. Question, Gary, Thank you. Uh, thank you for speaking to us tonight. Gary Cameron's my name. Following uh, an earlier reorganisation of local government in 1989, uh, David Shan and Graham Horsley and others were commissioned to write a report on local government finance. It was uh, well received at the time, but uh, I have not any recollection of the philosophy of financing, which was discussed and detail and laid out at that time for local government, being adopted. And I have asked on a number of occasions to the local authorities what is their position on the Shan Porter report. They neither know nor care. And I wonder whether we're talking a lot about costs tonight, whether there's enough emphasis on what's been considered in the meantime in this process on longer term financing. It's the big picture that we really should be getting our uh, our calls into. How do they intend to fund it? You mentioned that this is about derivatives. I find that absolutely amazing because you're right, it's a speculation. So my, my view is, and my view seems to be different to most other people, um, I'm just taking the common sense peasant approach like you would do in your own home to say, well, okay, we're going to tighten up. Where are we spending the money? Everyone's looking at, oh, how can we get in more money? It's all hang on. Stop for us. Let's find out exactly on a cost on a line-by-line -line accounting basis, where exactly is the money being spent? How is that not just plain common sense? Every dollar, where is it being spent, invested, and borrowed? Because we don't know. And in Auckland, as I said, there are billions going God knows where, and it's not okay. But what I want to do is just remind people that anyone here used to be in Auckland 30, 40 years ago? I oh, you know you would have been about 80 years ago. <laughs> but, but what happened was that back in the day, we had the Auckland Regional Authority, okay? It was a strong, thriving regional body that built roads, dams and bridges and ran the public transport. And what we did, it oversaw civil defence, established regional reserves, improved regional planning. And we had local borough councils. You know, the tree falls over outside your house and you ring up Joe, you know, and he sends the boys around with the truck, chop, 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 pulling the truck off it goes. Now, contract. You've got to have a contract. And as soon as you have contracts, you have to have contract management. And they say, oh, council staff keep going to have a contract management. We need the consultants to project manage the works contractors. So you've got this ginormous, what nice bird a double layer of private sector contractocracy and compared with a single layer of not-for-profit public service bureaucracy. And I get them on about the bureaucrats, the bureaucracy, excuse me, it's the contractocracy that I'm really concerned about because with all due respect to elected councillors who are present, you swear enough to the public, to uphold the law, and in a small, tight council like Carterton, Marston, or South Wairara, but you, you probably have a, a very good idea where the money's going. But I can tell you, in Auckland, here's the picture. It's like you've got a mantelpiece, and underneath the mantelpiece is this raging fire. This is the CCO, this is the action, this is where it's all happening. And if you look at the flow chart, the mayor and the councils are sitting there like useless ornaments on a shelf. Seriously. That's honestly, because I go to council meetings, I look into the reds of their eyes and I challenge them inside the town hall and I think, I mean, this is no respectful, but I cannot believe how useless you people are. Why is it my job to tell you your job? I read the law. They swear to uphold the law. I haven't got that statutory duty. I just... Just read up, you know. And I think, how on earth did they just make it up? And who is holding them accountable? 
Or I tell you this all over the house, people like myself who have put my freehold home on the line and I had a couple of hairy moments. General Patterson once said, it is not rash to take calculated risk. Well, I had a couple of hairy moments, I can tell you, but what's happening is <coughs> you can turn a bad thing into a good thing and when it tips, it turns into its opposite. Where I am with my rates case, I have produced 126 pages of new evidence. Okay? And that includes part of what you saw tonight. Rates assessment notices where I've gone through with a, with a pencil and I've compared what's on the rates assessment notice with section 45, Local Government Rating Act. Just one page. And I've gone through, okay, that's A, that's B, oh my goodness, we're missing C and D. And, and after I completed that exercise, I thought, good grief. What do you think? That before Auckland Council and previously Auckland City Council sent out hundreds of thousands of these on an envelope, somebody would have spent 20 minutes doing what I just did. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that the statutory third party watchdogs, like the Office of Auditor General, would do a systems check to make sure someone in the council did that job? Seriously? I've got cops to the Office of Auditor General who, in my considered opinion, are spectacularly and profoundly useless. And I, I say that in Karen May, but I don't know how many times I've been to them on different stuff and they have done it at least squad. Anyway, uh, what's happened is in the Oasis 2012-2013 uh, audits of local government, they have expressed concerns about the fact that a lot of councils have not followed their statutory obligations and you know what really kicked their butt as a word? The revolting, wonderful, wonderful residents and ratepayers who challenged what happened in Kaipa challenge what happened in Kuiper and they, what happens is that they raise their concerns, the Office of the Auditor General kept ticking the box, everything's fine, everything's fine, and then what happened was central government trumped them over the top, and at central government put right that which was not the way to that local government level. But it gave the, I believe, in my opinion, the Office of the Auditor General a hell of a fight. A wrong going on Sunday of the guest speaker at their AGM, because I've met I've met them, and, and honestly, you know, decent New Zealanders, they, they should get a medal. You know, I mean, what they've had to put up with, it's not right. It's not right. Right, Richard? Yeah, when I was on the local council here, we were audited every year. Yes. Uh, I think it was government's point of order came in, it yeah. cost us 1% of our rates. Yeah. Is not the Auckland Council not audited? Uh, uh, can they find out where this money's going? Like I said, seriously, um, yeah, I've, I've attended four international anti corruption conferences, okay? And I, uh, I've, I've met the experts, luminous material put their head around it, and I have to say that the markets for the New Zealand's rotten with corrupt conflicts and untrues. And one part of the problem that we've got is Transparency International New Zealand, um, who they're part of Transparency International, who come up every year with this corruption perception index which New Zealand, over the last seven years until this last year, used to be top. Right. And, um, and their number one platinum sponsor for Transparency International New Zealand was... There's a lot of money to be made out of maintaining that perception that New Zealand is the least corrupt country in the world. It is a tradable commodity, yeah. and that's a reality. Um, just while we're on that, um, why do I say this? There are two forms of brand corruption. You've got brand corruption and petty corruption. You get they've got cop 50 bucks to be off the ticket, that's petty corruption. Brand corruption is what happens at the highest levels. Who here has ever heard of the form of brand corruption known as state capture? Anyone heard of state capture? State capture is where vested interests get their way at the policy level before the law is passed. The policy analysts meet and deal with vested interests and treat them as if they are an independent third party. Business roundtable, that's where they used to focus policy. Because under statute, the Office of the Auditor General and Office of the Ombudsman are prohibited by statute from going anywhere in their policy. They've got to wait to, for it to go through the parliamentary sausage machine, come out law, then they can check whether or not the law is being applied. But policy, state capture, all right? We're bottom of state capture. And the other one is um, what's known as post-separation employment. Anyone heard of that? Revolving door, have you heard of that? Revolving door is where people, um, where there should be a quarantine period,
period, 18 months to two years, if you've been in the public, public sector, public office job, what should happen is that you should not be allowed to go anywhere near where you could use your previous influence, contacts or whatever, in that private sector job that you go into. New Zealand, at the, it's like, yeah, permanent rotation, that, that, ro that, that revolving door at both central and local government level happens all the time for most people. And the other one is, what would the TPP do uh, in regards to if it is signed regarding these super cities? Is that an ongoing corporate takeover? Is it a continuing of? And does, does that enslave us more? So, what you talk about when you talk about derivatives and you talk about all this fraud, uh, our people have, have had uh, atrocities towards us through fraud, through the councils. Uh, for over the 125 years that have been around. Also, we have a water water problem as well. But uh, if you can elaborate on something. John. Well, um, having literally opposed the Auckland Service City from day one, myself and another community activist, we opened that there was going to be a meeting of the Mural Forum, which is not a creature of statutes, like the local government of New Zealand is not a creature of statute, like the Society of Local Government Managers is not a creature of statute, and these people seem to draw power and authority, God knows from where, some law, um, to do and say this and that. Anyway, the small Mural Forum, basically the four city council mayors at the time um, were wanting to try and get rid of the ARC to help push the super city. And myself and my friend Lisa Prager, who's another community activist, we gave pressure, media everywhere, and we just said, you have no lawful authority to do this. Under Section 24 of the Local Government Act, um, we are supposed to be entitled to a binding hold that changed the law slightly since then. But you know, we made such a fuss that we helped to derail it. I also petitioned Parliament, Peter Sharples presented a petition back in and it's December 2006 for there to be no to a movement on Auckland regional governments until the public had been consulted. The Greens and the Māori Party refused to support Labour stuff, under Labour, um, to, yeah, and they wouldn't support it. So what happened was that the process got slowed up for about 18 months with the Royal Commission. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, that, that I do a lot of official information that request, I do a lot of petitioning of Parliament, I've had some successes there, and that was one of them. Yeah, so as, oh, sorry, as far as the, as far as the super city instance is, I opposed it from day one. I did not support um, Māori seats on the super city, didn't support the super city. Yeah. Is that answer your question, Oh, TPP. Oh, TPP, yeah, yeah, terrible thing. Yeah, yeah, no shopping. I mean, again, where's the transparency? What sort of partnership excludes the public? And like, how come 600 corporations can see the text more public don't? Yeah. If the will of the people is the basis of the authority of government, no public say, no TPPA. Nice. Matt? Uh, <laughs> um, my question is, I guess, back to the core axis. Um, I think 
the question she was asking was not of what he thought of, it was pretty clear about what you think. Um, so if we're not sure of what we think, how do we force transparency around the facts that we get? A lot of the comments that I'm getting from people is, I can read the report and I don't understand what it means. So how do I get a simple, factual understanding of what there's going to be with you? And I'm pretty sure that that's why people are here today and why 300 people were here on Wednesday, sorry, over the road on Wednesday. How do we get an understanding of what this really needs to be? I think what we need to do is demand is where is this information? How can we compare apples with apples? Where is this where is this information for the public? And if you can't provide that information, but here yeah, that this proposal must stop being with it. But the other thing is that why are they even considering any amalgamation where there has not been a full and independent audit of Auckland? That's so simple. And that's what the um, local government coalition, which is made up of, of councils around the country who are opposed to any future amalgamations, that is what they're calling for too, an independent audit. And this half by thing the Office of the Auditor General did of Auckland back in about 2012, that does not cut the mustard. What we need, what we should have seen was that this, that data back in 2008 when the local government, sorry, when the Royal Commissioners were looking at all the regional governments and then we could have had something to compare it with. They never did it. So is there a way for us to push for that to occur? Yes, is, it, is, it, is it through submission? Is it through another method? What, yeah. I, think, what I think is this, is that you do have a submission process and what I would very strongly recommend that any submissions that we put to the Local Government Commission is that, you, you know, feel free to use this wording or something similar. Legislation <laughs> made the 
ARC useless. The only thing they got left in control of was regional parks. That's the reality. It was, yeah, that was what genomics, and like I say, there's never been any cost-benefit analysis of the 1989 amalgamations. And how do I know? Because I did an official information act request to 85 councils um, years ago, um, about that time, 2008, and what I wanted to know was, had there been any cost-benefit analysis, and nobody could provide one. So it's like, okay, we're going to solve the problem that Rogenomics caused back in um, 1989 by having a bigger dose now. Brilliant. Not. And I've given you some of the evidence to prove just how disastrous it's been. Follow the dollar. Toastmasters here in Wairapa because we're an unbiased apolitical organisation. So they will be coming on the 18th and we will be pre sending questions to them. Um, next week I will be asking them how they want the meeting run. 
but that will be an opportunity to ask them questions. 18th of February at the event centre. And it will be run pretty much on the same line as Wednesday night was run. Unlikely there will be questions from the floor like this meeting. Um, we've, I've just got to find out how comfortable they are coming up here. What really concerns me is there have been changes made for the Local Government Act and again I would like to focus your attention on the role of CCOs and this is what really disturbs me how misled the public have been because it's going to be up to the next council basically to decide on CCOs but under this really legislative change the Local Government Commissioners don't worry, they have an eye on the whole CCO thing but they're just not telling you about it because that's the reality. First council control organisations, then public-private partnerships. Commercialised, corporatised, privatised. Because they've then got the economies of scale for the bigger contracts. Beware. Yeah. Question. Yeah. And I just heard of something briefly then asked. Yes, certainly. Many years ago, we put our hands around the hospital here in Wairaka. And the Wairaka Hospital was quite wealthy. It had six million dollars in bequests and endowments. And I was aware of this because a cousin of mine had left a lot of money to the hospital for a CAT scan. So we put the arm for the hospital. What happened? The six million went to Wellington to cover their debt. And why the hospital has struggled ever since. So just history is repeating itself. So, but my question is, is there a grand swell of dissatisfaction in Auckland that people wanting to do something about the status quo in our head? Why do you think they tried so hard to next them penny bright? Because they do not want a whole lot more ratepayers doing what I'm doing and refusing to pay their rates. So, oh no, yeah, people, people are not happy. They are not. And um, yeah, so anyway, what I think is wonderful about this, it kills two birds with one stone able to let people know the truth about Auckland and hopefully get more publicity out because these things that I raised seven years ago, no mainstream media publicity, simple common sense stuff, media were there, did they report on it? No they didn't, no they didn't. So it's all about making a fuss but because it was so outlandish what the council did and because you know I didn't, they blinked first basically. And um, yeah, and now it's not been good for the council at all. Because if I end up getting this um, rates judgment set aside, because I wasn't there for the hearing, and because I was actually involved in the Occupy Auckland movement as well, so Auckland council were picking on me over my rates at the same time they were picking it on me over Occupy Auckland. And when we got forcibly evicted from Altia Square, inside my tent I had a backpack and it had my rates, um, proceedings, my rates case proceedings in there, and I'd started the defence, then what happened was they confiscated my stuff, the Auckland Council, I never got it back, and I was swamped, because uh, uh, Auckland Council picked out two of us amongst all the hundreds of protesters they picked on me, I was a named respondent, and ended up being one of two successful appellants, so you can take on City Hall and win, I can fully explain, but anyway, so that, that's the reality, that, um, yeah, but that there's, more and more people are, are not happy with the super city. So maybe what we'll look at doing is the fact that, well, we just found that fact that 35% of rates are going to CCOs, no taxation without representation. I mean, that would throw a spanner in the works if people decide to withhold a third of their rates. Because when you pay a bit and you don't, you know, it makes it tricky. Yeah. Okay, um, the, the first. So, you cross much the backlash came out of Rodney, so. Sweet. Uh, Rodney. Not hide the problem, the some council. <laughs> so I think that's kind of where we're, we're looking for is, you know, how does this work if we're not happy? Well, it won't work and you won't be happy. If you're not happy, you know, you'll be really unhappy because, um, like I say, the example from Auckland, I mean, it's a horror story. Seriously. I think so, what Matt's trying to say is Rodney County Council is probably a similar district council. to the Waikato right. or District Council, whatever Rodney is. Um, 
it, it, I think we're kind of wanting to hear and yeah. understand your story, which is really, really awesome. But I think we should sure. be wanting to hear a little sure. bit more relevance to the wider Vata yeah. um, in relation to the city and, and some advice maybe okay. that you can get. What would be good there is um, what I could try to facilitate is, is it's best if people talk directly to each other. I mean, Facebook, whatever, um, you know, maybe through carbon voice or whatever, you put out the call. You want to hear directly from citizens and rate payers from Rodney. I showed you my rates assessment forms. Those are cold, hard facts. And what, you see, what I, um, what I've suggested that Auckland people could do is make submissions to help stop the Wellington proposal by including those two paragraphs that you have already said, um, but to include the evidence of their before and after rates assessment bills because you can't argue with those. You can't argue with those. Can we also have uh, Lee Brown come down next to Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Bring us What's the chance of the other day? So, you love that question. Yep, you know, it's fine. It's one, two, three. Have you actually found this um, some sort of algorithm, algorithm or any reason of me and actually putting the budget towards? So, I think our biggest concern over here is that we're going through the campaign service. I'm refusing to pay my rates because they're not telling us where the money is going. You can't have transparency and accountability without proper written records. And in my considered opinion, if the Public Records Act 2005, Section 17, was implemented and enforced in a proper way, which says that local authorities must create and maintain full and accurate records, including those with, with private sector contractors. If that was enforced, then we would have a transformation in transparency in this country. But unfortunately, the body that is charged with enforcing the Public Records Act um, 2005 is another, in my considered opinion, useless, toothless body known as the National Office of the Archives. And what I think should happen is that it should be split the role. That what should happen is National Archives should look after the disposal, storage and disposal of records. And if the Office of the Ombudsman looked after the creation and maintenance of records, then what would happen is they'd save themselves a lot of work um, with public complaint because they can't get information they should be entitled to. Well, if, if the information was made available for public scrutiny, it would be win-win. That's my view. Got that wrong? Good on you. <laughs> Yeah, hi right. Penny. Um, I think we're we're all pretty on to what's going on, and I think it's about time that you know it's fine to ask questions. We all know we're going to get sharp. Where can we go? Where can we go from here? Let's let's be proactive and try and get something going instead of tossing. I've seen it happen so many times. Why don't we just get a thing in place? Someone put their hand up, whatever, and say, okay, let's move forward from here. We can argue backwards and forwards to our we bloody blue in the face, and I've seen it happen so many times. Let's be proactive. Those who uh, want to go with the super city, piss off now. <laughs> <laughs> Those who don't, <laughs> Those who don't Let's do something concrete and substantial to make this happen. Yep. So I know it. Adios, amiga. Oh, just, it was just a simple question. Sure. Uh, you, you've said that there hasn't been an independent audit of yep. the Auckland City. Yep. There, there actually has. It's called the housing market. House prices in Auckland are going through the roof. So if there is all this dissatisfaction in Auckland, why are house prices like a rampant bull? 
Now, one of the reasons might be, one of the reasons might be, rates in Auckland per capita are lower than they are in Carlton. Bullshit. That is a fact. You must be bullshit. Adios, amigo. Just on that point again, you must look at the bullshit as well. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Just to screw the point here, well, what can we do? Well, one of the points of Carter and Voice is to actually organise and mobilise ourselves in a way that we can effectively oppose the uh, joining of the, of the super city. Now, there is, a, there is a legislative process that we have to follow, and that's the one we're inside. And the first one is that we have to put in submissions by the 2nd of March. So by now you should all know that we're holding workshops at Tarragon Cafe every Monday night on, on getting your submissions in. So the clear thing is, the first is the first obvious thing you have to do, right? Each one of you must put in a submission. Any of your neighbours, anyone you know who is opposed, or even if they're pro, we don't really care. The point is, this is your future, you've got to make some kind of input into it. Now that input, first of all, is to put up a submission, okay? If you don't know how to do that, or you're worried about it, or at some point you want to make, come along to Tarragon on Monday night, starting 7 o'clock, and we'll help you work it out and make sure that your point, the point you want to make, gets across and is heard by the local government commission. Once all, once all the submissions are in, then what happens is the local government commission takes those and they consider those and they start having hearings. So the other thing we want to do when we put on a submission is we want to say that we want to be heard. Okay? The more people that are heard, the more it kind of slows down the process and makes it very clear to them what the people are actually saying and that we care. There's a message simply in putting in a submission. If we don't put in any submissions and we don't turn up, what do they assume? That we don't really care and they can just, you know, roll a coaster the whole thing through and there is no real opposition. Opposition does require some effort. After that, after that, after the after that goes through, they'll come out with a, a second proposal. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to that one, uh, we can either accept that and say, well, that's fantastic, they've changed it all around, or we have to oppose that. And then we trigger off the process for a petition. And that's and and it could be if there was enough opposition in the submissions that they would pull it. Now we've heard uh, that if there was enough opposition, they may in fact pull the whole process. So that's another reason why we want to be very effective and really get in as many submissions as we can. It was quite obvious that the Wairabba simply does not want it in droves. Why would they keep pushing it? The other thing, and I've picked up on what Penny has said in one of the messages tonight here, is the costs. As far as I'm concerned, from what I've pulled out of, of reading this draft proposal, is that the costs are, are rubbish. Um, it's a philosophical change. Jeffrey Palmer actually said that when, uh, in a public meeting when he came here a while ago. Somebody asked the question, will the super city enable us to have uh, more efficiency and a lowering of rates? And he said, well, I don't think that's really the issue. It's more a philosophical change. It's a philosophical change, right? 180 million bucks for a philosophical change. We are going to lose your democracy. That's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to get. It's quite clear. People have been saying that tonight. It's a clear message. We have to stop that, you know, and this is where the buck is with us. But there's a process we have to follow. So they come back with the next proposal, then we really have to trigger the petition and make sure we vote and then get that out there. That is, that's where we're at. But really the key thing is to get the submissions in. That's really what you have to do. Uh, from Carter and Boy's point of view, we have a website at the moment, it's, it's not very um, informative, but what we're going to be doing is expanding that with a blog and putting in lots of opinions and allow people to comment on that as well. So you can inform yourself, just have, have ongoing discussions so you don't necessarily have to come here in a, in a public place, uh, but we want it to be a resource that you can use and understand and create good, good and effective arguments. A 288 page document, and somebody said earlier on, where, where is a simple, clear statement for the arguments? 
And what I was discovered or was told in, in government was, if you can't say it simply, if you haven't got the facts, what you do is you make a long and huge you know, report that people aren't going to read. And that's exactly what we've got. It, people just put off 288 pages of, of, of waffle, is mostly what it is. So that's really good, pretty much what I want to say. Thanks, sure. for a guy who's probably got a cheap bag, I would imagine. Um, so at the back we've got carbon voice bits. Um, we'd love everyone to put one of these in the back of your car. Um, can everyone read that? Wherever is not a Wellington suburb. And on the website, on the home page, we've got all the various things you can do. So there's plenty of things you can do. Those are also available on the table as well. Any other questions for, any other questions for Penny? Before any other questions, I'd just really like to state again that I believe, um, in my view, the line of march is to try and get the draft proposal stopped. Stop it now. That's my view. I know that you, you, you know, backstoppers that, that um, yeah, that they can reorganise the proposal and then the final proposal, then you've got 60 days to petition. But I reckon if there's a full frontal campaign demanding the process to be stopped because A, you've been lied to, you've been misled, you have been not been given the facts and evidence upon which to make an informed submission, stop the bus. There's other things that can be looked at as well. Um, who I worked closely with was Graham McCready. You may remember Graham McCready, helped to get rid of um, John Banks. I was one of the three people who made a complaint to the police about John Banks and when they did nothing, and dropped the ball, Graham McCready picked it up. The rest is history. But, I mean, who knows? Maybe there's some uh, injunctive process or whatever to help stop the proposal now. Maybe there's a way of involving the minister in, in terms of, well, because the local government commission, they are a creature of statute. And the thing is to find out, well, sure as, sure as eggs are eggs, part of their statutory duties are, do not extend to lying to the public, misleading you, misinforming you, and not giving you the proper facts and evidence. Where's that bit? Just, there are many ways. Okay, so I would say there aren't much we have one more question. It's quarter to nine, um, so we'll have one question. I think it would be very interesting hearing all this. I was involved with the hands around the hospital. 16,000 years mm -hmm. held hands around Martin Hospital. <coughs> and the Minister of Health at the time was Simon Upton. And he said to me as he was getting back in the car, just remember, we know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> So just a couple of things, um, you're all able to buy drinks if you wish to after the meeting. Um, Sam, who's the TV person, would really love people to go up to him after this meeting and the question to ask is, are you, he wants to ask you the question whether you want Super City or not and why. And how many people would you like, Sam? Oh, as many as possible. As many as possible. Uh, with so a these... reason, I've got work at 5.30 in the morning, so <laughs> yeah, I've got so to drive back to Wellington. If you don't mind time. being televised, um, if you could do that, as I say, Cardiff and Voice um, volunteers will be over on that stand over there. And finally, I'd just like to thank Penny so much for coming down to the Wire Rapper. She's been very, very busy for the last few days. She did attend the meeting on Wednesday night and got a real understanding of the different ways that different organisations were thinking about the proposal. And I'd just like to remind you that Penny doesn't actually get paid for what she does. She's self-funded. And um, any money that you would care to leave will go towards her flight and accommodation. So with that, um, Penny, thank you so much for coming. Um, I was going to, because I thought I might have to open it because Mike was supposed to do everything on that last minute. I, I actually knew, Penny rang me. I think she had spoken to you, Ron, and you had given her my name. Penny didn't know who I was, but I knew exactly who Penny was because I was a third former at Kurinae when Penny was a prefect. And it was one prefect I remember, and it was Penny Wright. <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my project is to help get this, this 
datum, and I think that if that, that is going to be the thing that um, so that'll be my priority, and uh, do what you like with it. See, it's just a draft that can be tweaked, but it's the basis to stop the season. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Penny and I go back a long way. We went to college together and we were on the Warwick Trades Council. I was born and raised in Marston. My father was a Freemason. I was brought up to serve the community. I moved to Otiki in 1979. I'm an enemy of the state because I dare to say make our roads safer, give us public transport, better health services, stop polluting our waterways, and most importantly, expose the corruption that is local body politics. I heard a gentleman over here, he's gone now, he mentioned 1989. I was one of two people in the House the night that they passed that legislation, the first reform in local body politics in over 100 years. First reform in over 100 years. What it was was the Labour Party were trying to break the power base of the farmers. We used to have counties and boroughs. Now we've got wards and districts. Now, the very first mayor, of Kepi was the late Ivor Trask. And in his words, they made three mistakes. One, they created too many political positions and they're paying the base. And he laughed, he said, I shouldn't say that because I'm one of them. The second thing he said was that they've handed the power to the bureaucracy. And he turned to me as the youngest in the room with all the councillors and said, it's going to come home to rest in your generation. And that is exactly what's going on. Now, an example of Kepi. We've just been given the joy of water meters. If anyone's got a computer, I recommend you Google a documentary on water and the World Bank. Without water, there is no life. And the powerful people who want all your money have seen that, and they're trying to create the monopoly. We've got to stop that. Now, looking at the big picture, what's going on here with the super city? They want the water of the Wairapa. They want the water of Kapiti. So I recommend everybody don't let everybody else do the donkey work. Stand up and be counted. Apathy is a politician's best friend, and they rely on it. I heard Jill say that we're going to try and get the commissioners up here. Well, Anne Carter's from Martinborough, and if you put a jug of beer on the table, Basil Morrison will be here like a shot. You've got to stand up and be counted because they don't like it. You've got to stop them. You've got to do like you did with the hospital. Hold hands together, power to the people, because you are the democracy. Don't let these local body politicians bullshit you and say that they're giving you a democracy. They're not. For example, I make a lot of submissions on transport. I pay to go to Wellington, I give them my three minutes of time, and I make my submissions. I don't even have the courtesy of a written response. They meet the obligations of the law, and that's it. So I can only re reiterate what this gentleman said. You must all stand together and stop it. Thank you.